Greetings and welcome to the East Coast Anti-Federalist Show. My name is Brutus. I am joined here today by Kona Bianca. We can be reached online at www.ecaf.us. That's E-C-A-F or D-C-A-F without the D. We can be reached with questions or comments at info at ecaf.us. And we have a couple of loose ends we need to tie up this week because I've been sick and I've been in Trump mode. So I noticed that in some of our previous episodes, I I started talking about things and then I never... I was just going to ask you, what is Trump mode? (laughs) It's like scatterbrain, right? Exactly. (laughs) So I hope for you to do that. But just before the show started, I was talking to Kona about the recent elections we had here in Maryland. And... First time I've lived in Maryland for more than a quarter century, and that's the first time I can remember where the presidential contest had not been decided by the time we had the primary. Have you ever been to a contested primary before? Well, in 2008, they had the primary in February, so which is a lot closer to, because I remember it was on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. But so, it had been decided everybody was dropped out except for the nominee. No, no, no. At that point in time, you still had Ron Paul and uh, Mitt Romney Mitt Rom- in the I, race. I, I voted for Mitt Romney, and I remember that he was not in the race anymore, that I went to the polls and voted for him just so I could say, this wasn't my fault. Okay, let me see. <laughs> the, you're, you're torpedoing a favorite story of mine. I hope I'm remembering it correctly, but, you know, as, as time wears my memory, I could be mixed up. But it's possible that Ron Paul was still in the race. Super Tuesday on January 31st, McCain received the endorsement of California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and began campaigning with him. He won his home state of Arizona. The next day, he appeared confident that he would be the Republican nominee. Meanwhile, Romney advisors privately expressed doubts about whether their candidate could realistically hope to defeat McCain, and it was unclear if Romney would spend significant money on key February 12th contests in Virginia and Maryland. So, the writing was on the wall, but... I guess Romney was still in the race. On February 14th, Romney officially endorsed McCain and asked approximately 280 delegates to support him in the National Convention. So we decided, or we hoped to decide, (laughs) I guess we must have voted for McCain. And uh, and that was kind of known that he wasn't going to win, but he actually stayed in past Romney. And people were kind of looking like, why are you still in the race? Kind of like John Kasich now and kind of like Newt Gingrich last right. time. It's like, why are you still in the race? And there's all these things about speaking in the convention floor. And why didn't you put Ron Paul's name in the nomination or something like that? So a lot of Ron Paul supporters are still angry about what happened, especially in 2012. Yeah. Because they were really trying to win it at the convention. And don't put it past happening this time. Okay, I just that's all I want to say. <laughs> don't put it past that happening this time. Yeah. If you don't see a Trump Kasich ticket, you might see a Trump Paul ticket. Interesting. Yeah. So. Very interesting. But I, what I said, my my friend asked me about it. My my minister friend, and he's like, you know, so you think Trump's going to get it? And I and I explained to him what I explained to you last week. How all he has to do is get half of Kasich's delegates and half of Rubio's delegates, and he just walks away. He gets probably way, way more than 1237. But if there's a surprise on the convention floor, you know, I don't know what the establishment people are going to do. Maybe the Jeb Bush people will say, hey, we're going to, you know, it's the second round of voting and we're going to take 500 delegates and we're just going to hold them until you put Jeb into nomination or you put Paul Ryan or John Bolton or somebody, you know, one of these big names that's been floating around that they've wanted to put up there, but they never really make a serious play. So I don't know what the establishment's going to do, but I could anticipate seeing a bunch of Ron Paul people, let's call them Rand Paul people, doing the same thing and saying, we've got our 300 delegates and we're not going to give them up until you put Rand Paul. He doesn't have to be the presidential nominee, but you've got to make him VP. And and, and so there there could be a lot of deal-making, infighting, back-and-forthing, and I've said more than I want to say already, so let me just leave it All that. right, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody but. does. In fact, I have stopped making predictions in order to stop embarrassing myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important to know that, that the very first Republican election that when Abraham Lincoln was elected was just like that. Yes. He was nowhere near the front line. And I have never liked the idea of party elites picking candidates. I mean, when I was listening today, it was sort of interesting that that's the way it used to always be done. And then it was the Democrats who led the way with, no, no, we need popular votes, popular votes, popular votes. And Republicans followed them and started doing popular caucuses and, and primaries. 
And then the Democrats had the disaster of Jimmy Carter. And they decided, you know, popular votes, maybe not such a good idea. <laughs> they didn't want an outsider, because he was an outsider. He was not the party's candidate. And he oh. came in and got into the presidency. Mm-hmm. And then the rest, of course, is disastrous history. So then the Democrats created their superdelegates, which was a way of handing power back to the party elites, away from the people that they supposedly represent in the Democratic Party. But Republicans haven't done that. Republicans are still getting their candidates through popular election or caucus. And there's some speculation that if Trump is the nominee and it's a disaster for the party, they'll be in the same situation the Democrats were after Jimmy Carter and will seek to come up with their own superdelegate plan Hmm. to stop people from choosing. But I do like the idea of contested conventions, partly because it gets people's attention. People have to watch what's going on. And otherwise, who who pays attention to a convention? Right. When the candidates already, well, what what a big snooze fest. Right. And it's so funny because even watching some of the, uh, I was watching a speech from the Colorado convention and there's a black guy, Daryl Glenn. He is going to be the Senate candidate on the ballot. But see, a lot of these states have like follow on primaries or follow on conventions or something. So there's still other people trying to get on the ballot. He's not going to be necessarily the nominee. But he's the only one so far who's definitely going to be on the ballot. So the other people have to buy their way on or whatever. But anyway, so I'm listening to his convention speech. And it's just the same old tired, worn out lines that you would hear from Rubio or any other Republican candidate running for office. Lower taxes, boost the economy, individual liberty. And he's a great guy. You know, he's I'm a proud Christian conservative, all these kind of things. But he isn't giving me any meat. He isn't giving me anything to say. If if it were a contest between him and somebody else, he's not giving me anything to say he's better than anybody else. So I hope he wins with that message. But considering that he'll probably have a couple of millionaires running against him for the nomination in the primary, which still won't be the general election. And then he'll probably face a millionaire Democrat. Sounds to me like he's not a millionaire, you know? He'll face a millionaire Democrat who, you know, it's Colorado. This is the state that just legalized pot. It's a state that has Hickenlooper as their governor. Uh Uh, Very good chance that the Democrat could win. So I'm hoping he wins. But I would like to have seen something a little more dynamic, a little more, dare I say, yes, we can kind of speech, you know? It wasn't. It was just standard blah. But that's safe. You know, you you can't go wrong with tested sound bites, but there's too much of that. Anyway, the interesting thing about primaries is they're not elections per se. I mean, they don't have to have primaries. People have been bantering around talking about the history and how they only came out in the 20th, 20th century or I don't know. I don't know when they first came around, but... Primaries? Yeah. Yeah. It's not like... It's not a fundamental right. Right. It's not in the Constitution. No. And political parties are not in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So here we have private clubs selecting their nominees the way they choose to do so. Yeah. And if they choose to say, we're all just going to pick lots or play dominoes and whoever wins, that's the nominee. Well, that's the way they do it. And if they say, we want a popular vote, you can do that. If you want to do a caucus, you can do that and everything in between. So people really... And and it, it frustrates me because every year... I don't hear it so much. I mean, I don't go to Democrat meetings, so maybe it happens at Democrat meetings too. But I go to Republican meetings, and there's always an independent who shows up, which is to say a person who has no political affiliation. And they say, I want to be able to vote in the primary. I want to be able to vote in your Republican primary. And I'm thinking, you just don't understand the system, do you? And the sad thing is I explain it to them, and then they still walk away going, I demand the right to vote in your primary, (laughs) you know? And it's like, you know, you give them knowledge, and it still doesn't, uh, you can't make them drink, right? So, (laughs) so, well, hopefully people will get smarter about it. Each party is a private club, and the real tragedy of our system is you have to go through the private club to get on the ballot. So I was running in the 4th Congressional District. There were three other Republicans running. And I may have said this before, I may have not. The only reason I put my name on the ballot was because I didn't know anybody else was running. And I didn't want Anthony Brown to walk into a congressional seat and be able to sit there for two years and then go run against Larry Hogan in 2018, you know, keeping his name out there completely uncontested, right? So I at least wanted people to have somebody else to vote for. It turned out that George McDermott, who won, signed up in April. Okay, wow. so, so basically a year, April of 2015. So a year before the actual primary, 
is when he signed up. So he was his his name was nowhere because you go into the board of elections and you got the list of people who've recently signed up and yeah. stuff. You know, people aren't signing up in November, uh, early December for a primary that's in April. So it goes back several months. So he hadn't signed up in September. He hadn't signed up in October. I'm thinking, hey, nobody signed up. He signed up in April. And then I think Mr. Therian and Mr. Buck signed up after I did. Which was a possibility. I knew it was a possibility. But by the time I had figured it all out, it was too late to take my name off. And so my biggest problem is I just didn't have the money to right. run a campaign because I'm trying to put kids through college and I have to prioritize. And that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. So, and, and <laughs> it's a good one. I, but, but I think that the voters were actually mad at me. I actually got emails from people saying... We're not hearing anything about you. We're not getting any information about you. Oh, really? And I would reply and I would say, well, thank you for... And and, and I'm the only one with a website. Really? You know, I have a website, I have a Facebook page, I've got a Twitter account, you know. Yeah. You said that Red Maryland had endorsed me. Can you, like, forward me a link or something like that? Um, Because I... Yes, I heard it on... They said it on the radio. Klein's show on the radio. Yeah. Probably not the last week, but like the week before the election. Okay, but you don't have like a website. I I don't, but I haven't searched for it. And I don't know if there are transcripts of the shows. I don't think there are, but I could probably link to it. My my point is I was looking, I was posting because I had gotten their newsletter. And their newsletter is just, don't vote for David Therrien. Or George McDermott, because they're pro-choice. Yeah. Or I think it was mostly focused on David Therrien. I think think they left out... George George McDermott is pro-choice, okay, in in a big way, I think more so than David Therry. And I think 4th District voters are going to be real surprised when they got this guy going, I'm not going to come between them. I mean, he got mad. You you weren't at the meeting, but it was a Northern PG County meeting, and George McDermott just started preaching, like, I am not going to come between a a, a woman woman and and her doctor. And I was like... Whoa. <laughs> do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> because the question had come, the guy running the meeting didn't even want to ask the question. He, so he said, forward me the question on a piece of paper or a note card, and I'll read the question. And even when he got the question, he was hesitant to read it. He was like, I don't know, this is, this is too political, this is this and that and the other. And it was just simply, are you pro-life? And when the crowd kind of, we had like mob anarchy there, they're like, read the question, just read it, how she wrote it, and let the candidates answer. And then when it finally went out, yeah, it was easy for me, yes, I'm pro-life. And then David Therrien kind of danced around, and then, like I said, George McDermott got like indignant, and I was like, wow. <laughs> I don't think he will. There are some poker faces in the room, but... Aside from the poker faces that, you know, they sit on the Central Committee and all this kind of stuff. So you never know where they're coming from. The people who asked the question, and probably, therefore, half the room, were definitely pro-life. So I'm thinking, he lost their votes. But I'm also thinking, you know, I got 3,700 votes. I would say I did not see, with my own eyes, in campaigning, 370 people. And I'm pretty sure I didn't talk to 37 Republicans. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So, hey, that's a great return on, on, on exposure. Now, there is the fact that I was in the paper and all of this other stuff. You're but. in the paper. You're online. You mm-hmm. have some name recognition from the work you did with Protect Marriage Maryland. I could see that working all in your favor. I guess the thing that really dismayed me the most was the fact that I didn't get invited to speak to more groups. The only way, therefore, unless you're in the know, unless you're connected to the system is to have somebody in that club saying, hey, you're running for office, come out and talk to us. And, and literally, there were people who I helped in 2012. I helped them run. Mm-hmm. I campaigned with them. I went out, I went to events with them. I handed out their literature, and they did nothing for me. And I'm thinking... Did you ask them? Yes. You did. So, I'm not going to hold it against them, maybe. Because here, here's one of the things that just frustrates the heck out of me. If you're on a central committee... You're not supposed to help people before the primary. Maybe that was their reason, you know? And for all I know, they did everything they could. For all I know, they voted for me and they told all their friends to vote for me, which is really all you could ask. Mm -hmm. Let's go to break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We were talking about the election. And I'm doing it kind of begrudgingly, but (laughs) but (laughs) once you get my mouth going, I can't stop. (laughs) There's so much to comment on. So there was an article in Red Maryland that was posted called More Pro-Abortion Republicans Running for Congress in Maryland. And I guess this is probably by Brian Griffith. Yes, it is. When was it posted, do you know? Uh, 
What's the I, I date can pull on it the up. article? The article itself is dated January 27th, 2016. So early on, yeah. So this is a while back. And it may be one of these things that gets updated every now and then. So the first thing, and I knew this back in January, they were kind of pointing out who was pro-life and who was not. And they asked pretty much everybody, like, do you support, is it the Hyde Amendment? Because Hillary Clinton was claiming that she wanted to overturn the Hyde Amendment at that time. And they were pointing out, you know, no answer, no answer, no answer. So from all these people, they were getting no answer. And they tweeted me. And I think they emailed me and stuff, too. But I responded by a tweet. And, you know, I'm doing my 140 characters thing. And I'm like, do you support the Hyde Amendment? I'm like, of course. But that's really not what we need to be focused on. Like, we need to repeal, overturn Roe versus Wade. Yeah. So we need people who overturn Roe versus Wade. And it was at that moment that I think Greg Klein or whoever at Red Maryland, you know, really kind of, they retweeted my tweet and, you know, kind of got a thumbs up on that. I'm actually surprised that I'm the only person in the 4th Congressional District. And when you start looking at all these other districts they're talking about, Ami Hober and, and all these other people really weren't giving pro-life responses. All right. It's really, really hard to believe. But this particular article has a line in it that says, Fourth District candidate David Therian identified himself as pro-abortion in his response to our question about the Hyde Amendment. My personal convictions, and this is David Therian quoted, my personal convictions are irrelevant when representing my Maryland District 4 constituents on the Hill. My responsibility is to cast my vote in accordance with the desires of the Maryland District 4 voters. As their representative, and after talking to many of my constituents, they are neither pro-life nor pro-abortion. They believe there are a number of circumstances under which they would support abortion procedure. And then they go on and talk about Liz Mattari, uh, who is half black and half Filipina. And their quote of her is that she is unabashedly pro-abortion as well, going as far as urging people to stand with Planned Parenthood. That's on her website. Yes. <laughs> Therian and Matoy, they spelled her name. Matori, right. it's I mean, actually. But they spelled it. They well. misspelled it, yeah. Um, which they have a lot of editing errors on that website. It's kind of irritating. Uh, join Ami Hober, who won her nomination, as pro-abortion Republicans running for Congress in Maryland this year. And then and the Ami Hober story, that goes back a ways because she said something. And I'm sitting here just watching hours and hours of her talking to different Republican clubs. And I'm not hearing what they're saying. So she must have written it somewhere or said it and it not gotten recorded and stuff. But she said something that gave them the impression that she was not pro-life. And then she comes back and she says, you've quoted me wrong. And there's this whole back and forth between them. But she never comes out and says, I am pro-life. Right. <laughs> so, so which, which is it, Avi? <laughs> I'm, I'm tending to you know, agree with the guy who's calling you not pro-life if you're not willing to say, I am pro-life. My comment on this was that someone alarming to read uh, that Mr. Therian actually presented himself as sport, supporting quote-unquote traditional values just two days ago because we had had a, uh, an event in Anne Arundel County and the first thing he said when he stood up was, I support traditional values, probably acknowledging that I was going to be there and I was going to present the conservative position. But I also heard him say this other line, that as the representative of the people in the 4th District, I had to take their views into account and so, and that's all he left out. He didn't talk about them being neither all pro-life or pro-abortion. It's just they're just weasel words. They are. The whole thing is, is illogical and weasley. But he does something that a, that a, an experienced politician should never do, which is obviously he lost, yeah. <laughs> just like I did. So it doesn't make a difference in the long run. But he thought he was going to win, and so what he's doing is he's setting himself up to go to the general election, saying, "No, I never said I was pro-life." I'm willing to work with you. I'm willing to listen to the... Because he's got to win votes from Democrats. Yeah. I'm a reasonable Republican. So that this is what he's preparing himself for. And I love to point out that when Republicans slash conservatives capitulate on the issues, they still lose. They never learn from that. We've got a whole history in the state of Maryland of people saying, we've got to move to the left. We've got to move to the center. We've got to support illegal immigration. We've got to support gay marriage. We've got to support abortion. And a whole litany of Republicans who've done that and still lost. So why don't you actually stand for what you are assumed to stand for? And then if you lose, you will at least lose standing for the right things. 
rather than saying, well, we've got to capitulate on everything. This is the whole logic behind Trump. It doesn't matter that he's all over the board. It doesn't matter that he doesn't stand for anything conservative. Get an R in the office, and then we can work with him. Well, no, you're not going to be able to work with him because he's run on a platform saying Planned Parenthood does good things. I'm not going to defund that. And all the other stuff. And then I follow up and I say, you know, Liz Matori, I haven't met her. So I don't want to say she's a bad person or, or what. I'm going to assume she's a good person with a good heart and all this other stuff. I'm glad that for whatever reason, because there was some story about her having been an independent and not being sure where she'd run, that she decided to run as a Republican. Somebody convinced her that Republicans aren't racist, they're not trying to see you hanging from trees, your voice is needed in the Republican Party. But, I say, being a black and a Filipina, most Filipinos are Catholic and yes. therefore pro-life, right? right? You would think that she'd be more concerned about the threat to the lives of innocent babies of minority ethnicity. And... Obviously, that she's either not heard the rhetoric or it's just not registering with her. So, you know, it's not meant to be a direct attack on her, but we need people just like her in the Republican Party spouting the pro-life position, not saying stand with Planned Parenthood. So, I'm sure you wanted to say something about this. I well, I... You say she may be a very nice person, and you're just speculating on that. Mm. Um, what we know for certain is that she has terrible punctuation. After the Red Maryland article appeared, which we should stress included quotes right off of her website, so they weren't misquoting her. They were taking her own words verbatim and putting them in her article for people to see and then commenting on them. And there's no question she's pro-abortion. She just spouts every single cliche you could imagine to go along with it. But the funniest thing of all is how she responds to this. She responds to Red Maryland, and the author of this particular article was uh, Brian Griffiths. So she gets on Twitter with her Twitter account, Liz for Congress, mm -hmm. at Liz for Congress, and she directly addresses Red Maryland and Brian Griffiths, and she says, where is your spy? And there's no, she ends that sentence with a period rather than a question mark. Mm -hmm. So it's apparently a statement about their spy. Mm -hmm. And They're then spying. she says, I'm not pro-abortion. I'm get out of women's vaginas. Explanation. <laughs> point. Oh my goodness. Could it be more cliche and more ridiculous? And why is it? This I honestly do not understand. Why feminists always have to get so vulgar. Why can't they have a modest, civilized debate? Why do they have to be so crude all the time? I mean, I would never say anything like that that no matter how angry I was and then her final sentence is totally incoherent to surprise she says it's between her and your conscience mm -hmm. and I think maybe she means between her and her conscience uh, I don't think she means your conscience right. but it's kind of interesting to speculate on what it means if she does mean your conscience but just um, after reading that tweet my goodness I'm embarrassed for her well, you could make a lot of jokes about her probably going to public schools or <laughs> you know, anything like that. But it sounds like, and people do respond to things like that when they are emotional. Yes. And I'm guessing that she was probably emotional. And people have commented that Twitter just needs to go away. It just, it, it does nothing. It, 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 you never hear anything good come out of Twitter. Right. And so it's a great place to go and embarrass yourself. It's not a great place to win the Nobel Prize. So guarantee people express themselves poorly, uh, are often misunderstood, and even if you say exactly what you mean, all your so-called followers, who are probably your enemies, are going to take what you said and twist it out of context. That is such a hard lesson to learn. When I was teaching writing, I used to explain to my students, I said, if, if you write something and 80% of the people who read it understand it the first time through, you just hit it out of the park. Right. That most people will misunderstand you. Right. And, and you have to work really hard to be as clear and as understood as possible. And even then, you're going to get people who don't understand you. But last week, we, we were talking about a lot of different things. And I want to hit this one thing before I even start talking about Prince. And that is, we had gotten into the transgender issue. And there is a person on a show called Orange is the New Black who calls himself Laverne. Cox. So I looked it up. And, and, and why this is important is because if you go to like the wiki page, what's Laverne Cox's name? Laverne Cox. And so this is one of the things about Prince that kind of got me because I'm sure Prince's name was John Rogers Nelson. 
Really? But if you go to the wiki page, it says Prince Rogers Nelson. Yeah, that's what I read. Was that was his name, and he just went by Prince until he changed it to some symbol or something? Right. Well, they they took his name. That's a big issue as well. The, Who's they? The music industry, the music oh. label. Like, there was this long fight. So, like, after he had gotten real big in the 80s, the interesting thing is he has some records that, you know, no doubt he's a talented musician. He's a genius. Someone commented, I think it was Van Jones or somebody, saying how they're just years worth of music just stored away that you've never heard of by Prince. And, and I don't doubt that that's true. Uh, I have a cousin who just, you know, everybody else is like, yeah, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson. And then you're like, no, Prince is a musician. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Michael Jackson is a performer, right? So he, he had done all this and developed his name really big. And then the music industry said, no, that name is copyrighted to us. And we decide how it gets used and not you. And he's like, but that's my name. And I think somewhere in there he must have changed his name to Prince, but it didn't matter. And the music industry had won out. And so there was this fight that went on well into the 90s, I believe. But but in the late 80s, he comes back as the symbol. I think it's spelled S-Y-M-B-A-L. And that's where that weird little, not quite the male figure, not quite the female figure, not quite the Mercury with the pointed arrow. And then the little thing that looks like a horn off the side. It's a, it's a weird amalgamation of a bunch of stuff. But that's literally what's called the symbol. Mm-hmm. And so that's what he changed his name to, and then nobody understood what that meant. Yeah. And so that's when he said, oh, the, the artist formerly known as Prince. <laughs> and so I was reading the article the other day, and it said, the athlete formerly known as Bruce Jenner. You know, <laughs> da, 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 da. And it's like, it, it, they, it went, they went past it so fast, you really had to be in tune with what was going on that week to yeah. get it, right? And I thought that was such a clever throwback. But uh, So the artist, artist formerly known as Prince, and then he changed it to just the artist, and then finally the record industry caved and gave him his name back. And so he was known as Prince. So, but I, don't, I, I distinctly remember reading John Rogers Nelson. Now, when you read the wiki page now, it says his father's name was John Rogers Nelson. Uh. So now I'm trying to figure out, did I read it wrong however many years ago I looked it up? Or did he really just change his name? And now we're doing a kind of 1984 thing where they rewrite history and the original information is now lost. We don't know. But Laverne Cox is in the same category because, you know, where is Laverne? Usually you go to Wikipedia or IMDb. I think I found this on IMDb. And you find their, their original birth name. But because this is a man who is presenting himself as a woman, and that would be culturally insensitive or non-PC, however you choose to phrase it, you don't see any indication of his man. So I found... From Wikipedia, Laverne Cox was born in Mobile, Alabama, and has an identical twin brother, M. Lamar. Now, I don't think anybody names their kid M. (laughs) And and M. Lamar plays the pre-transitioning Sophia in Orange is the New Black. Okay, so I go to VH1. VH1 VH1.com notes that uh, uh, Laverne Cox has dated a lot of Jewish men, implying, of course, sex. And you're just kind of like, ew. And it's either to say something about what Laverne Cox likes or what Jewish men like. Because, well, I was going to say, is it because she's dating men or is it because she's dating Jewish men? Well, is there a, something I don't know? It's a given that she'd be dating men, but yeah. or he'd be, be dating men, but it's the Jewish part that kind of makes you go, hmm, you know. And, That's odd. I mean, it is and it isn't. If you, if you know enough of any group of people, there, there are certainly kinky ones among them. Yeah. But stated like it is it seems to imply that they're all like that. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's why it's kind of creepy. Let's go to break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. If you go to, like, the wiki page, what's Laverne Cox's name? Laverne Cox. But from telegraph.co.uk, Cox and her brother, so it refers to her as a her, real name Reginald grew up in Mobile, Alabama. Mobile, isn't it? Is it Mobile? I think so. Now, and Lamar was born in 1972 in Mobile, Alabama, as Reginald Lamar Cox. That was Laverne's first name? No, it's M. Lamar's first name. M. Lamar, okay. I thought I had it. Well, minute. where's the M in that? Oh, it's not. <laughs> it's a stage name. Oh. So the Reginald in the Telegraph article is referring to M. Lamar. Laverne Cox is Roderick Laverne Cox. So Roderick is... <laughs> Laverne Cox is... Original name. Now, lesson to parents. 
don't give your child a middle name. That That's could be female. <laughs> who confers with a female name because maybe they'll decide to grow up and be a female. Just say it. So, <laughs> and, and people do this all the time because, like, you know, you'll, you'll meet people and, like, they'll have a last name as a middle name. Or right. oftentimes it's after some relative or they're trying to give a nod to someone who was important in their life or something like that. And, and I don't know the story behind him having a middle name, Laverne. And this actually might not be true. Maybe it was Reginald or Roderick Leroy Cox or something. But have you ever heard of a man named Laverne before? I mean, I've heard of no, a man named Leslie before, but not exactly. I, there are there are there are some names like you said, Leslie. Um, or, or one of my favorite British names is Llewellyn. Llewellyn. Yeah, my division officer in in the Navy was named Larry Llewellyn. I say his last name, <laughs> Larry Llewellyn Luthley. L L L. Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> That's first, I, I'm surprised I pulled that out. But of course, Llewellyn sounds like L O U dash E L L E N. Yeah. That's not how it's spelled. Right, it's no. it's like L E L L E L W Y N or something like that. It's a total British thing that probably goes back to times before there was a Britain. You know, maybe it's right. And who's that British author that people always think is a man, but because he. They think he's a woman because he has a woman's name, but he's actually a man. Evelyn. Okay. And it, it, for a woman, you'd say Evelyn. For a man, it's Evelyn. Evelyn, Evelyn. Waugh. That's who it is. <laughs> Evelyn Waugh is a man. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I think was it Time Magazine recently did a list of the favorite female authors, mm -hmm. you know, and they had a list of 100, and they had Evelyn Waugh. <laughs> <laughs> So those of us who are English majors were having a great day of smug superiority <laughs> to the clowns at Time Magazine. And there's a, you know, lots of playback. You know, J.K. Rowling. You name yourself J.K. Rowling because you don't want people to know. You don't want people to know. And, and I don't personally like that, but I'll admit that I'm biased. So maybe it's a good strategy. I like The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, even though, you know, it's John Ronald Ruel Tolkien. Yeah. I don't like the Elfstones of Shannara, who is by... Does it have a female protagonist? That's something that always trips my husband. He does not like reading stories about females. You know, if it's an adventure story, he wants the protagonist to be a male. Mm. Otherwise, he's turned off to it, which is an interesting psychological dynamic. I don't think he'd be See, turned I'm off to wrong. a female it's author. Terry Brooks. No, 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 it's not, it's not the Elfstones of Shannara. It's the, it's the Dragon Riders of Pern. Anne McCaffrey. Okay. Okay. And so I never... Actually, I have the book. I have the trilogy. But I never cracked it. I never read it. Because, you know, whatever biases are in me, just decided, you know, wow, how could a woman write a good story about knights and, and manly men and stuff like that? Which, you know, sorry, but that's just how the subconscious works. So maybe J.K. Rowling is doing something that's good for business by disguising her gender. And I've talked about this before. I, I believe in keeping the feminine feminine and the masculine masculine. Mm -hmm. So women are not heroes and sheroes. They're heroines. There's something I was reading about uh, a woman. It might have been even Rosario Dawson. And she's out here getting arrested for something silly. Black Lives Matter or whatever. And she says, I'm an actor. A-C-T-O-R. I'm an actor. <laughs> and it's like, oh, so you're, you're, you know, you're not even allowing me to make you an A-C-T-E-R, in which case it would be gender neutral. Right. You're an actress. I'm sorry. Rosario Dawson. I don't like you because you look like a man. <laughs> I like you because you look like a woman. Plain and simple. So Laverne Cox is a man, as far as we know. And so we know, okay, his actual name is Roderick. His brother's actual name is Reginald. And they've tried to disguise all that. But the idea was out there in my mind because I was thinking, you know, with all this gay stuff going on, and there are gay scholarships, okay, because I'm looking up scholarships for my kids, and it's like, oh, sign up for this LGBT scholarship. No, thank you, delete. But they're out there. Well, if they now have alternative schools, they're going to eventually have, if they don't already, gay alternative colleges. And if they have gay colleges, well, you're going to be able to get scholarships to those gay colleges. And just like you can get a scholarship to go to a gay college, I'm pretty sure you can probably apply to Harvard or any of these other colleges that readily accept LGBT people and say, I want to apply for an LGBT scholarship to go to Harvard. What does this amount to? Reparations. 
And so I've been saying for years, gays are going to get reparations long before black people are. So I go to these candidate forums and they say, will you commit or will you promise to sponsor legislation calling for reparations? And every single black candidate up there, I think uh, everybody there was black, including myself. Every single one except for myself says, yes, yes, I will sponsor legislation to call for reparations. So this is Anthony Brown, Glenn Ivey, Jocelyn Pena, Melnick, Warren Christopher. Everyone saying, yes, I will sponsor legislation to call for reparations. Gets to me, uh, in my heart, I cannot do that. <laughs> you know? And I'm going off about... Uh, now, we've been free from slavery for 150 years, and we're still complaining that we need our 40 acres and a mule. Guy gets, gets up out of the audience, and he doesn't uh, literally do it, but in so many words, he calls me an Uncle Tom. An Uncle Tom. Why? <laughs> because I'm not trying to take a bunch of white people's money and separate it. There's white people in the crowd, okay? Yeah. And I'm pointing at them, and I'm like, they want to take your money, and they want to give it to them because of something that... You didn't do something your parents didn't do, something that your grandparents didn't do. It's something that happened a hundred that ended, I'm sorry, a hundred and fifty years ago. But here we are whining and complaining about reparations. But we, black people, have made it possible for gays, most of whom I would argue probably aren't black, there's plenty of black gays, but it's not about the black gays, it's about the white gays getting reparations before we ever even come close. I haven't heard about reparations for gays yet, I bet that's new to me. Well. <laughs> I'm just not as up on stuff the, the, as This you is are. the thing. They may not use that terminology. Right. But they feel like they've been persecuted. Right. They can point to their Stonewall riots and whatever other, you know, being burned at the stake and all this throughout history. And they can say, you know, that's what, you know, the F word that people don't like to use anymore is considered so ups upsetting because that was the slang word for a homosexual. So, you know, here is our, our suffering. Here is our equivalent of slavery. Here is our civil rights movement. Pity us and give us the same thing you gave Martin Luther King. Right. And we've enabled that. And th this is what turned me off to the whole civil rights movement. Once I realized that the civil rights movement wasn't about making sure that black people could drink from the water fountain. It wasn't about making sure that black people could go to school and get an education. We were able to do all of that. But it was about government mandating that whatever belief you had in your mind, you're not allowed to have that belief. And it came to me really when, something that Rand Paul said actually, but it followed, uh, and, and maybe it was an accident, but Bob McDonald, governor of Virginia at the time, had done something around, there was like a Confederate History Day or something like that, and he signed a proclamation recognizing it. And, oh, it was just like, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. And I was like, well, why not? He's the governor of Virginia. Yeah. That was the capital of the Confederacy. He was in Richmond, Virginia. I would expect him to do that. And here I thought he was going to bring together black and white, Confederate and, and, and Union. And he completely turned on a dime, apologized, and said, no, I, I didn't mean to do that. And I said, wait, 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 wait. You know, I'm not saying Bob McDonald is a racist or a Confederate sympathizer or anything. But what if he was? Does he have a right to be? And more importantly, whoever says something like that, whoever says Rand Paul at the, around the same time had said, just like Barry Goldwater, that he opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it doesn't matter why they did. I played an audio last week of Barry Goldwater explaining his vote. And he was saying that Lyndon Johnson was the biggest phony ever because Lyndon Johnson had filibustered the Civil Rights Act in 1957. He was an opponent of civil rights all the way up until. And then in 1964, I guess he couldn't stop it, and he signs the law and says, we, shall, we have overcome or we shall overcome. Well, Barry Goldwater is on record saying that's the only civil rights bill I voted against. I voted for the, all, the, all the other ones before, and there were just two provisions in that bill that I couldn't support. And basically they were the ones that tell you that you can't use your property the way you choose to. Mm -hmm. And that's government coming in and telling you what you must think and what you must believe. But nobody cares about that. Basically, if you oppose that, you're a racist. You gotta support everything or else you're a racist. And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, do people have a right to be racist in their own hearts, in their own minds, in their own homes? When we were doing the whole marriage fight, one of our ministers got up and he gave a testimony and he looked over at the gays and he said, you know, I, I understand what you're feeling. When I was a kid, I wanted to play with my friend. I met my white friend on the playground and he wanted to take me back to his house and, and 
We wanted to play in his house. And we got to the front door. His dad said, you can't come in here, you know. So I know what you guys are going through. And I said, wait, 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 wait. You're trying to go into somebody else's house, <laughs> okay? Doesn't his dad, as, as much as you might have felt offended, and I would have felt offended too, but as much as you're going to tell that dad that he has to take you into your house and, and take you into his house, that's his house. He has a right to be a racist in his own house, doesn't he? And this is the question, do you? Do you have a right to be a racist in your own house? Do you have a right to have your own beliefs in your own house? And the civil rights movement is all about telling you, no, oh, yeah. you don't have a right. And that goes beyond racism. Mm -hmm. Because now you're a Christian. And you believe in the Bible and what the Bible says. And you're, you're out there in the world and they're on TV and they're having gay sex and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, hey, that's TV. I just won't watch that TV station. I just won't be out there where they're doing that stuff. But this is my house and this isn't going to happen in here. Well, civil rights movement is now coming into your house and telling you you have to accept it in your house as well. And that's why, that's, that's the whole, you know, once I realized that, I was like, gee, this, this whole movement has been orchestrated by the communist left. Because it's fascist. Yeah. It's going to use the power of the state to force you to bend down. Prince, just a quick comment on Prince, how do you get to be 57 years old? Singing all kind of songs about sex and love. I mean, I talked about Darling Nikki and Erotic City last time. Because I was, I was pointing out that if you play, at the very end, because we were talking about how there's all this sex, 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 and then at the very end, there's obviously something that's played backwards. You play it backwards, and it's not just the gibberish that it sounds like, it's saying, it says, hello, how, how are you? I'm fine, because I know the Lord is coming soon. So I uh, came across two articles. One says, this is WashingtonPost.com, Ranji Prince was actually a conservative Christian who reportedly opposed gay marriage. Quoting from the article, Then there was the time Prince came out against gay marriage in a New York profile in 2008. He slighted Republicans and Democrats. Quote, Neither of them is getting it right, he said, but singled out same-sex marriage as part of the Democrats' notion that, quote, you can do whatever you want, unquote. God came to earth and saw people sticking it wherever and doing it with whatever, and he just cleared it all out, he told the magazine. He was like, enough. And then, from a different article, it says, Ture is saying Prince was a conservative or a Republican. And he says, Susan Rogers, his engineer in Purple Rain, told me he was a conservative. And Eric Leeds, who played saxophone, told me too. Like, his final argument with Prince was like, quote, I finally figured out what you are. You're a Republican, unquote. You think about songs like Ronnie Top to Russia. He was a conservative. In the mold of, I am making money. I'm successful. I want this money and this success protected. I don't want civil war or nuclear annihilation or any upheaval. So, part of it may be that he was a Jehovah's Witness. We'll talk about this more, hopefully, in the next episode. Until then, keep fighting for freedom. And keep the faith. The faith. The faith. The faith.